Okay, now we can get going. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm here to do a QA and a um, with the team behind Pavement. Um, I'm here with, uh, this is really weird, I always want to say like on my left, but I've got no idea <laughs> you don't know where, where everyone is actually, yeah. so I can't do that. But anyway, Jason Wingard, who for some reason is labelled Hannah Stevenson, We'll Hello. That another time. There he is, <laughs> Hannah Stevenson. On my screen. Who is the in another person? room of her house? She doesn't know. <laughs> <laughs> there is Hannah Stevenson. There is Steve Everts, who's one of the cast, and Liz White, who is another of the cast. Um, and we're going to talk about pavement. Um, we're going to kind of assume that everybody has seen it, so that we can talk about it without worrying about spoilers or anything like that. Um, but just to refresh everyone's memory, because there are twenty films and it is a lot. Um, pavement is the story of a woman played by Liz White, who um, uh, finds a man, literally, homeless man, literally sinking into the pavement, um, played by Steve Everts, and her attempts to save him when everybody around her seems very indifferent and has quite a lot of other things, kind of other agendas going on. Um, so to kick us off, um, why don't we start with you, Jason? When did this idea come to you? And I guess selfishly from my perspective as one of the producers of The Uncertain Kingdom, did you come up with it for us or is it something you already had in mind? Uh, no, I, it's, it's an idea that I had in mind. You know, but sometimes, you know, you have films and the, all you've got is an image. And this was one of those films. And then I kept adding to that image. And so it started with the idea of somebody sinking in the pavement. And you think to yourself, oh, this is such an obvious metaphor. Why has no one done it? Mm. <laughs> Thankfully, no one has. So, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And then when I saw the Uncertain Pavement, uh, the Uncertain Kingdom uh, come about, the funding come about, I thought that it fitted your brief perfectly. So that's why I submitted to the Uncertain Kingdom at that point. Uh, but it, it, originally, I started writing it as kind of like a a modern day parable and that's essentially what it is it's just a kind of like a little moral tale isn't it you know about the way that we deal with homelessness and yeah and that's what it that's how it started we looked at it for um for eye features as well yeah. to stand it out to see that kind of how it worked long form as well but then it it, it always excuse me down to something more simple so yeah, yeah. It, it suits a short format, doesn't it? You know, it's a punchy little the small tale. So getting get out. And I think, yeah. Um, so we're really pleased when you, you guys got behind it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we were very pleased too. It was one of those um, pictures, I think, but just because it had such a strong image at the heart of it. And as you say, it's such a, such a strong metaphor. How could it possibly have not have been done? But it hadn't been. And I think it was one of those ones that kind of came across the desk where that image was so compelling. It was very easy to see what you were going to do with it, you know, and you guys had such a strong pitch and such a clear vision for it. So it made it very easy to commission it. Um, yeah. When did you get involved, Hannah? I know you guys have worked together before. How early are you in the process of developing things? Um, I, first, uh, uh, the first time they told me about it was when we were doing, uh, it was a few years ago when we were making, I think, either In Another Life or, um, Eaten by Lions, he used to tell me the story of it and we were like, it was just there and it was, uh, yeah, that was, so when, and when it was put in and that was it, really, I was on board really. Yeah, but, okay. no, yeah, no further question. <laughs> <laughs> it's that simple. And for you guys, um, the cast, I mean, what's it like when you get a script like that? What's, what goes through your mind when you're deciding what to do? Liz, let's start with you. Oh, well, um, I had to make a very quick decision because by the time it came to me, I think we were like a week away from shooting or something. So, um, and I know what it's like, you know, very, very low budget film. You need to, you need to know. Um, and it was just a case of logistics because I absolutely love the script. And again, the image of this homeless guy sinking into the ground, not being able to move and also being part of the streets that, becoming part of the streets that we walk on, which is very much how it feels when you walk around the cities. Um, I just, I wanted to do it and, it, and it, we could make it work. So yeah, I, I was very excited to do it. Good. And for you, Steve? Yeah, uh, well, it, it was the image. I didn't even realise that the script was in the email. <coughs> I just saw the image and it, it is such a powerful image that like you said, the whole story is encapsulated in one very powerful image, and that I knew straight away within looking at it 
after two seconds that I wanted to be involved in it. And I, I, I didn't even realise that the script was with the email. I thought it was just a picture. So I, I agreed to do it on the strength of just an image. And then I read the script and thought it was great. Yeah, well, I mean, let, that's good. Sorry, glad Jason, you, go ahead. I'm glad you didn't go, oh, God, the, the script's disappointed. But let's dig into that image a bit more, because obviously it's a lovely, simple thing to say and then an incredibly difficult thing to achieve. Um, Hannah, can you talk us through, from a producer's perspective, what that's like you hit you know you read these couple yeah. of lines oh he's casually sinking into the pavement yeah yeah what happens next for you uh well the first thing i, d I did or the first thing that i was worried about was the sort of the visual effects and how to make that look real we did um before we even came down because we saw once you sort of put in for something even if you don't get it you get kind of that energy behind it and you start thinking god nobody knows how to do it and uh, we weren't sure, we did loads of tests with like cornstarch that was dyed green and one of our pals was sinking uh, into it and things just to see kind of what could work and what could give us the right effects. And actually got uh, in touch with um, an effects house very early on who agreed to be part of it because they just loved the concept. And actually as time went on, they had a Netflix thing that came, that extended out and went over and then they couldn't do it anymore, so they couldn't send anybody out. So then we were kind of like left just having had a, a few conversations to try and get what, what we thought was the right thing further down the line. And then actually there was quite a lot of rethinking and lots of companies that I approached were, were kind of a bit kind of uh, hesitant. They didn't want, to, nobody seemed to want to come on board. So actually what I had to do uh, through, throughout, the pro, throughout the process was try and sort of, get more people on board and actually quite a lot of students were and, and tutors and, and, and people from different universities really were just like keen to, to try loads of different things so it's a real mixture of different ways of doing it but but really in terms of producing that was something that I thought of and thought we'd fixed really early on with like bringing uh, bringing a team on board um, but then it sort of came out differently and then um, in terms of Obviously, the, it, it was a um, it was a, a great deal of money, but what we wanted to do was something much bigger, kind of than the budget, sort of the the twenty k budget. Uh, so, um, it was kind of how how do you do it? So it was just brilliant, really. Everybody that uh, worked on it uh, came on board and and worked for free, and kind of the it was just sort of a. Everybody it just it sort of struck a chord with so many people, and and, and uh, yeah, we've got a great team around us up here, which I'm very thankful for. Well, I mean, yeah, can we talk a little bit about the location for the film? You guys were always really specific about that. Um, can you give us a, a bit of background? Yeah, we we looked. Uh, do you want to talk about this, Jay? Oh, it's fine. We looked all over, really. Um, we wanted something very sort of generic that could be a city centre, sort of high high rise city centre, sort of anywhere in the world. Um, and we started looking around, kind of. Uh, we looked in uh, near home in Manchester, uh, which is quite built up with skyscrapers. And for a while, we were going to be there, but then we looked at it, kind of over a weekend and it was just so so busy it was going to be causing us loads of problems um so then we we just scouted out loads of industrial estates and things and then um jay uh did did uh, came up with what did a scout of his own he's brilliant at locations aren't you jason lingard <laughs> well we needed a place where, i knew what we wanted for this because yeah. we needed something quite specific somewhere where you could control the footfall and yeah. have it so it felt like you were in the city but you it wasn't so loud with the you know for the sound mm -hmm. uh so yeah it was quite a specific thing that we wanted so but i think we got you know we once we found it we were pretty determined to get them to cooperate yeah. with us we weren't going to take no for an answer and they did initially say no so yeah they did it was a uh, manchester uni wasn't it yeah. um, but, you know, they, they were brilliant in the end but it's sort of just getting through the red tape he was getting to the right person mm. yeah. we got to, we got to the dean didn't we yeah <laughs> well you had to go quite high up yeah we had to go high up yeah yeah, yeah. 
Wow, so Jaden fits to the lecturing there. So he was like pulling all things behind the scenes and, and I was being nice as pie and we managed mm. to get through. They, they were really, really supportive in the end as well. Um, just while we're still on the sort of the physical side of production, there are so many methods of VFX wedged into that film. Mm. And I wondered whether Jason, you could talk us through combining those, what were they? Some of them were physical, I know some of them were VFX. How does that work? I've been in this situation before where I'd made a film and we had an effects team with us and then we got onto set and we thought we had an effects supervisor and this effects supervisor is kind of turning, looking, looking at us and going, right, well, what are you doing? So I think that eventually you just have to start to trust your instincts on it. And so it, it was a little bit chaotic and a little bit of guesswork as to what we needed from Steve and from Liz and where we needed them to be. But I kind of had a rough overview of how we were going to do things. And that was enough really to carry us through because at one stage, you know, we kind of talked briefly there about the, uh, the cornstarch bath that we had and one made at one point. So we were going to try and do it as a practical effect, which would have been very punk rock, but very impractical mm -hmm. on set. Um, and then, you know, there was, a, a, we were talking about using a 3D model at one point, but we made the model and the model failed. Yeah. And so we had to readjust constantly to uh, what we were doing. But the main thing for me, I knew that the important, but I didn't think that the film hung entirely on the effects. You know, it, it hangs more on the performances and what the film is saying, I think, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. uh, and the effects are the secondary element to that, in, in a way. I think, that, I think that's definitely true. I mean, I, I spoke to my dad over the weekend and he gave me a point-by-point um, point analysis of each of the Uncertain Kingdom films. Um, right. And by his own admission, he was like, a lot of them went over my head. Um, but he absolutely loved Pavement and it made him cry. And oh, that is so uncommon. And I think it is just because the starkness of seeing what we all know to be true, just told in that image, it, yeah. it, transcend, it, transcends, it transcends whatever you may or may not have been able to do with the effects. Well, I didn't want this film to be preachy, first of all. But, you know, I think that when you've got such an emotive subject matter, you can let people just make their own minds up about things. Mm. So you let it sit there. And we all kind of like, you know, so it's about, you know, reflecting. But I was going for tears, so that's good to know. Yeah, I mean, you, you nailed it. The guy does not cry. I mean, I'm talking like... <laughs> I was crying on set, wasn't I, Steve? <laughs> I was crying on set when Steve was doing bits and pieces. Yeah, yeah. So very it's moving. Emotional film, yeah. Liz and Steve, were you quite conscious, you know, working with Jason and w kind of walking that tone of not kind of overdoing it because it the, the performances to me feel very it's obviously a quite fantastical world but the performances are very naturalistic and it's very underplayed is that something that you talked about <clears throat> no it's instinctively what what i did with it it's, it's the only way to do it really it's just, just to keep that real tone in it and uh, just it's, it's an everyman story really and uh, so i'm glad that came across because as, as jason said it, it, it spoke for itself the film you know, it's, it's such a powerful little film mm. that it would have been wrong to play it any other way, I think. I think it had to be steeped in reality, even though it was a bit, you know, strange yeah. and melting into the pavement, but it had to be just played straight, really. Mm. Do you it's often, Yeah, it's often the way when you, you read a script that's well written that as, as you're reading it for the first time, you're feeling all these emotions because at that point you're just the reader the witness or whatever and then you realize that when you play it you must give the audience the chance to be the reader and discover it you can't shove how mm. you feel onto it because then it just doesn't work mm. i think they kind of sorry 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 liz i kind of interrupted you but it, it was like i was just thinking there that when you've got you know really good performers and good actors there's not much direction that goes on on, on set, is there? You know, it's a conversation that you have beforehand. I knew that Liz and Steve both understood the material. It was more the supporting cast, actually, that I was trying to get something from. It was based around, you know, that short film La Cabina, which I mentioned in the pitch, mm -hmm. which was the Spanish short about the person mm -hmm. being trapped in the telephone booth. And I yeah. sent that to you, didn't I? Yeah, yeah, it was extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it was... It was trying to get that 
atmosphere of kind of, you know, this bizarre claustrophobia and, you know, from the, the rest of the cast, which I was trying to achieve, really. Mm. So we were all on the same page, weren't we, from, by the time we got on the same. Yeah. 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 I, will, um, I will happily dominate this conversation, but I do just want to draw the attendees' attention to the Q&A little box at the bottom of your screen. So if you did want to ask a question, you can just fire it away in text and I can and I can ask it for you. Um, but in the meantime, we spoke about this very briefly before we before we came on air, just talking about on air. Listen to me. What the hell was that? Um, <laughs> Very I'm, I, I'm, honestly I'm turning this into my evening chat show I've got like two <laughs> weeks like every night I'm getting more like look at me um it's disgusting and what I was going to say we spoke just before um about um how the film's meaning has kind of changed in the context of the pandemic and homelessness specifically has been affected and I wondered if you could all speak to that what it felt like knowing that you were releasing this film seeing that issue change <clears throat> well, um, th I suppose we were talking earlier before we came on and we were saying that how within I think a week of lockdown happening that homeless people or certainly a lot of homeless people were drawn from the streets and hotels were opened up so that they could have a room that they could isolate but I, I still think that um, there's issues that that's great and that shows like we said before that something can be done when when push comes to shove and it should have been done a long time ago. And it'll be interesting to see what happens when this is all over. Does that mean that people just have to go back up the streets again and mm -hmm. as they were? But then there's also, um, there's a huge area with it that goes from the streets to having a roof over your head, which is adjusting to have a roof over your head, being able to clean yourself, cook for yourself, be live an independent life within four walls or you know and and that needs a lot of attention as well and I, I volunteer for a charity called um, the hygiene bank and they provide it's like they collect donations and, and of hygiene products for the house or the body and then get them to people who need it and we are just our requests have gone up I mean I'm getting personal emails from single parents saying can you can you help you know, when it, 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 there's a lot of people, not, not I know we're talking about homelessness with Steve, but there's with Steve's character, but there's a lot of um, people now who are very vulnerable and in a lot of need. Mm. So um, it's sort of like it, it's, it's, it's highlighted mm. a lot of that, and, and like I say, so many people, more people now are being affected yeah. as well. What was interesting as well for me was that um, although they got people off the streets in record time because all the hotels was empty and such, is that some people couldn't cope with it. Some people mm. in um, institutionalised being homeless could not cope with four walls and a roof over their head and running water and electric that would flick the switch. And that says a lot about um, mental health issues as well that's being neglected. Yeah. I mean, you know, you take someone off the street and put them in in, in a house, a ho not a home, but a house, shelter, and they can't cope with it. That says a lot about us as a society when somebody can't cope with what we regard as basic necessities. Mm. Yeah. It's strange. Well, and as Liz was highlighting there, there's going to be all sorts of problems that arise that, are, you know, we're not seeing just yet that we're going to, we are going to see in the next uh eight to 12 months i guess and um you know people talk a lot about returning to going back to normal and as far as i was concerned lots of things weren't normal anyway and you were talking about that earlier weren't you steve you're kind of like you know and steve did a poem for us kind of like I'm this not, is a segue i'm gonna cue it it's yeah gonna cue it. yeah you should do it steve right i can't wait I can't wait to go driving polluting the air. I can't wait to dump plastic with hardly a care. I can't wait to turn rivers back into sludge. I can't wait to shove people in line that don't budge. I can't wait to drown birdsong out playing hip hop. I can't wait to hold toilet rolls when I do a shop. I can't wait for a traffic jam when I hurl abuse. I can't wait to send packing the deer and the goose. I can't wait to touch someone by punching their face. 
I can't wait to tell Greta she's an utter disgrace. I can't wait to do what I want. I know my rights. I can't wait to see coppers breaking up fights. I can't wait to see takeaway trays everywhere. I can't wait to see chemtrails up in the air. I can't wait for everything as it should be. I can't wait to realise that the problem is me. Very good, Steve. I can't wait to see who actually agrees with most of those things that you're saying. <laughs> oh, yeah, subconsciously. Yeah. You watch. You watch. Oh, I know there'll be someone. You watch. People are just so weird. People fighting over toilet rolls. I mean, come on. Yeah. Oh, no. and people are fighting over a bit of paper to wipe your ass. It was the pasta that <laughs> yeah, me. tells you a lot about society. Really. It was the pasta though. How many? How much pasta can you get through? I mean, really. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, we've still, still got our stock piled in the garden. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what are your um? What are your hopes for the film now that um? Now that the, I hope you can see this that on your chat, you guys. We have. We've seen an amazing poem. Yeah. yeah. It was um, amazing. Okay. Nice one. Oh, well, we've got a question coming in. I forget what I'm going to say. Let's do this. Um, Adrian says, "How do you feel of the experience of the film pivoting to an online audience? The pros and cons, and the way that you'll move forward in the future. Is this new future something you wish to embrace, or do you long to be back in physical screens?" Hmm. Thank you, Adrian. Right, I'm gonna pick on someone, Hannah. Okay, um, it's, uh, I, I don't know, the sort of, uh, what do I think? I've actually, I, I think what you, when you do something and then when you see it with other people and you, and you see people's reactions, that's when you, you kind of get a measure of how, whether the film's resonating in, in the way that you were, um, wanted it to. Um, we had sort of a cast and crew screening, which is uh, and for all of the people that helped on our uh, crowdfunder and stuff. So we had kind of a, a, a leaning towards positivity. And so I think if it was in a in a theater, in theaters or the theatrical release had happened, then we might have got a bit more kind of a, of a feel that was a bit less one-sided, if you like. Um, so there's that. Uh, but actually the digital thing is, is, is you know, it's, it's been fun and like doing this sort of thing is quite fun. Mm. Um, I don't know, I just, uh, I, I guess- You just want it to reach people, don't you? Sort of amplify the, the film in some ways, I think, if you, uh, digitally, I think. Because that, that, if, when you do the, um, when you do the theatrical release, you've obviously got all the different channels that you can promote it. So mm. obviously we've had the press and we've had like the, the um, social media sort of campaign. Um, but it's not being sort of t necessary. Well, we did have TV actually. What am I saying, Steve? It's actually very similar. <laughs> but it feels like it, it's just sort of smaller scale in some ways. You kind of make something, don't you? I do like it. It's smart. You make something, you hand it over to an audience. So as long as it's finding an audience, whether that's online or in the theatres, then that's 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 really good as well. And it's beyond your control. You hand it over, don't you, to at that point. So people make of it what they make of it. Mm. Yeah. But I'm, I'm really proud of this film, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's good. And what about you, Liz and Steve, as audience members, you know, how are you feeling about the experience of watching stuff at home versus being in the cinema? Are you longing to go back? Yeah, definitely. It, I, it's just that human element that's missing from a lot of things. Uh, being forced to lock down, I was on the vulnerable list as well, so I haven't seen family till very recently. Um, but I found myself missing assholes in the pub. So <laughs> I mean, just to have that human element there yeah. is kind of what's pretty everything. We really are yeah. a gregarious species. And it's all very well, it's sitting at home and shielding and, and lockdown and all that. But it's just the human element is missing out yeah. on so many things. Mm -hmm. Even this now, that slight delay on this is everything. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable that fraction of a second in time that they, how we talk to each other and reply and take information in. And this you find everyone goes quiet and then everybody jumps in because of that tiny gap mm. that's removed when you're actually in the room with someone. It's very strange. Yeah. I, think as, I think as well when, it, when uh, originally um, we got um, uh, our charitable kind of sponsor for the film, um, The Mustard Tree, 
they were really, really excited about the sort of community, uh, the fact that even though the film might not be direct representation, it was much more sort of uh, symbolic uh, of, 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 of something. That kind of like being able to chat about the issues and mm -hmm. actually try and just yeah. talk about what the film's talking about in in the community space to try and evoke change. That was something that we, yeah. you know, I still feel really strongly that that. I mean, that it's it's happen. still something that we absolutely want to do. It's it's just a waiting game. I think, but I think it is. It's one of the. I mean, obviously having um, physical screenings of the films, you know, when we originally commissioned them and the idea of a pandemic, I mean, wouldn't have crossed our minds. No. They were always intended to be things that we would all gather around and talk about. And they were all chosen because we felt that they would provoke conversation and people would have strong feelings yeah. about them. And so I think, you know, and, and Pavement is one of those things, one of those films, you know, as it shows in, you know, my, my own father's reaction, it's one of those films that it's, it's so evocative and we see homelessness all the time that we can become a little bit mm. kind of blind, not blind, but what's the word, kind of desensitised to it? Yeah, yeah, and really actually, have... yeah, seeing it. Situation. It's an emergency, it shouldn't be like... Yeah. It shouldn't be uh, able to be kind of... Uh... Yeah, it ought to blow your mind. It ought to, it ought to be you'd see someone like that and it would shock you. Um, and I mean, I guess potentially that's what happens when when it changes, but when we go back to normal. Um, mm. But yeah, de I mean, definitely the community screenings idea is 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 still our our intent because I think there is something about all being together and having a chance to talk about what that experience was like watching that film together and watch ourselves represented as failing. I think mm. You know those conversations, those arguments happening while he sinks. I think that yeah, it's very evocative. Um, my favourite last question to ask people is, um, what have they taken from the experience of making the film? Whether that's a practical filmmaking lesson or um, a relationship that's evolved out of it or some other thing. I'm going to ask each of you, Liz. Let's start with you. Do you know? And was there anything particularly you took from the film? Um. Only, well, not only, I mean, I had a great time doing it and I, I really, really enjoyed it, but just a sort of another drive for how important it is to engage with homelessness and vulnerable in the community and do what I can, do what we can to do our bit and help in any way, you know? Mm. Um, it sounds a bit cheesy, but it's true. That's it, you know, it's needed and it's... Uh, yeah it, it just keeps me volunteering really because i think it's really important mm. jason um we I, I we made this after we'd made uh, in another life so we uh, so in another life was the film that we made in the calais jungle and you see all the people living rough and on the tents there and then you come back to the uk and you start to notice the growth of tents in the streets in manchester and london and stuff like that uh but I think the thing that I'd take away from it is the, how we involved um, the charities that we work with. And I think it, the, the choir, which lots of people don't know, is a choir with no name. So there are homelessness choir that <laughs> sing the song for us at the end, sing Jerusalem. And so working with them, I think, was, you know, felt quite poignant. I know that when you're making films or if you're an actor or you're doing something, uh, Sean Locke described it as like turning up to an earthquake with a dustpan and brush. but you know this is <laughs> us doing our tiny little thing and because we're filmmakers this is the little thing that we can do and it helps people discuss and raise awareness and that's what we you know we tried to do with this film i guess mm. hannah anything from you um i think um you know to, to sort of echo kind of what the the other guys have said uh, i think on a on a practical more practical level i think I don't know, I just like feel like everything that we do, we grow our family a bit more and just like make it ready for some, you know, it just gives you that kind of impetus to go again and do something else mm. and bring people with us. Yeah. Steve, final word with you? It's just made me engage more with homeless people that I see. Yeah. Uh, I've always tried to not, I always try to do something, uh, but you can't help but become blind to it and, and you haven't got bottomless pockets otherwise you could spend all the rest of your life giving money away to homeless people and it still wouldn't solve the problem so 
what I try and do is just on a little personal level, like give him, buy him some food or money for drugs. I don't care what you spend it on. <laughs> no, if that's what gets you through the night on the streets, yeah, you can spend it on drugs for me, mate, and beer or food. It's your call. Well, do you know what? Um, when I've, what I've found and when I've spoken to people, it's like that lack of agency that people have and people just ignoring them is often kind of yeah. one of the worst things that you can do. So even yeah. if just sort of to connect with somebody and talk to somebody then that's yeah. worth uh, um, you know obviously like money and i just remembered actually han sorry that but when we were out filming the bloke who came out and oh yeah you got to tell that story yeah, yeah and the first yeah. scene yeah, yeah. yeah this bloke i mean and he, he was on his own he wasn't doing it to show off to his mates he he interfered he thought the security was uh, really rejecting my character from outside the bank and he took it upon himself to, to you know, interfere, intervene and, and sort it out. The guy was, it was basically like, Katie. He was, he, yeah, was yeah. Doing my, he was doing my character. Yeah, he was. Program. He was. He did indeed. Yeah, he just came out. He confronted the security guards as they were manhandling Steve. Yeah. Uh, and then we turned around and saw that there was a whole film crew there. <laughs> <laughs> That's so amazing. It was, it was amazing. Heartwarming. He was really nice. He was really humble about it as well. He was just well, like... Well, yeah. yeah, I'll never forget that. He was trying to keep his cool with the security guard, but it was like, this just isn't right. You cannot... That's right, yeah. You're not on. I remember him saying, it's just not on. Yeah. Uh, that is the most wonderful thing to hear. What a great thing to have seen to give you guys the confidence that yeah. you know yeah. the goodness is out there um that's a lovely note to wrap things up a uh, hopeful note thank you very much and especially steve for your poem that was lovely. Oh, yeah. um yeah. thank you for taking the time and thank you everybody who's thanks everyone to see, see it. you later uh, thank you. Okay, see you soon bye bye, bye. 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 bye.